How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Debate Night. We are back once again. Got some fun topics, some more new hosts today, really rolling through. We've got uh, so many new, new analysts this year, which is awesome. Uh, we're almost through like all of the new ones. I think we have like one more episode with maybe some new guests, and then we're going to kind of start bringing in the, the audience favorites. So if you're in the comments down below, make sure to let us know, like, wh who do you want to see make their returns? Who are your favorites um, from kind of the first well, cycle it was through? good while it lasted, guys. Appreciate yeah, you having me on. Yeah. You can't I'll kick wait, Brody off the show. I'll see you guys off. next year. Can't kick Brody off the show, um, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, we're going to get into it. First, let me uh, introduce our, our analyst today. Brody's here. Brody is here as always, and he will be forever. Yeah, I'm back. Um, you know, all I can say about my performance last week on the show and at the tournament was I was not late, and so hopefully I do not get any sort of penalty um, leading into today's debate night. There you go. No, no penalty assessed uh, as you were on time. Hunter's back after a week off. Yeah, I read the comments last week. Uh, happy I wasn't part of that episode. Hopefully, y'all are nice this week. <laughs> they were pretty mean last week. I'll say that. I, I was I was a little disappointed because I thought our our analyst did a pretty good job. So um, I don't know. I, I respect the honesty, though. You know, but just be nice. Be easy on. Listen, first time on the show. Be easy on these guys. But th we'll see what they're made <laughs> of. Uh, Jake Jake is joining us today. Yeah, my first time on the show. So please go easy on me, but. Um, yeah, living out in sunny San Diego, love disc golf, own Scoggins, number one fan. Wow. Okay. There looks you like go. you live in like a high rise condo and that looks like a, that looks, right looks like, like a million dollar penthouse suite over here. Right, well, guys, <laughs> Jake's got that Google money. Jake's like Look. one of the top 20, uh, first employees at Google. It looks like in San Diego, a million dollars will get you a, a one bed shack. So that is actually facts. Good yeah. point. Good point. Um, <laughs> and then the cast is also joined today by Jack. How's it going, everybody? My name is Jack. I've been playing disc golf for almost five years now and, uh, am a proud, uh, local to Waco, Texas. There you go. So five years, that means you're technically pre COVID or not. I am. You are yeah, pre COVID no, like right before it started. Okay. Okay. We yeah. got to keep tabs on this sort of thing. Um, all right. Well, we're going to talk a little bit, everything, uh, go over some stuff that happened at Austin, um, some more wide ranging topics, but let's hop right first into our, uh, let's hop right away into our first subject here. Uh, talk a little bit about the FPO division and uh, what's going on with the FPO division thus far into the season. So Ooh. this weekend, we saw yet another FPO division with little parity separated by large gaps between players. This has been a common theme in this division due to the smaller size um, of the division and newer players compared to MPO. Should the tour start designing the FPO layouts to be considerably easier in order to pack in the leaderboard and make things more exciting, even though this would be at the expense of the better players and scoring separation would the product be better as a whole, at least until the field grows and improves, or does this sacrifice the integrity of the division? A lot to unpack here. A little controversial, maybe Brody. What do you think? Yeah. I like what you're trying to, go with this question it feels kind of like the WNBA debate of like hey just lower the rims let let these women like dunk on each other that's what we want to see i don't think that actually holds up here though i have to strongly disagree with this i actually don't know why anyone would want to see this i'd be very interested in if anyone has a differing opinion on this panel uh to hear their reasoning for this my biggest issue is if you make the courses easier, shorter, my biggest issue with that is that there's going to be no incentive for the game to grow. Right now, there are a bunch of people on tour that are having to make a decision. Do I spend the time, effort, and get better at certain areas of my game that I'm struggling at? Or do I continue to just get left in the, in the dust? And if you reduce the skill level, reduce the elements that you need to be able to score well on these courses, now all of a sudden that takes that away. And those players don't have to do the work that, I mean, we, we've seen it with Evelina. Like Evelina has shown that the work that she's put in these last couple years and maybe this off season the most in her putting has improved her chances and she actually won a tournament already. So we've seen it can happen. Um, I don't like the idea of making courses easier. I think uh, people just have to elevate their game. All right. So Brody, not in favor of this idea. Hunter, what are your thoughts? 
Uh, yeah, no, I, I have to agree with Brody almost word for word. Um, first off, I am team lower the rims WNBA, but <laughs> I think that is different than here because that still lets the most athletic, most skilled players shine because it's on a level playing field. Yeah, the rim's shorter, but that's a lot different than what we're talking about here. I think making the courses easier is a short-term solution that would create long-term problems personally. Um, Because right now, the layout, as Brody was saying, the layouts are pushing players to get better, which is by nature, over time, pushing the field to get better and will increase the level of play. And then eventually, we will have a deep field like MPO on tough layouts and we'll be watching better golf versus like right now, if we were to shorten it to where it's really competitive right now, it'll encourage people just to be as good as they are right now. And there's not as much motivation because they're already going to be competitive. So I think it's just suffer through it if you even want to call it that i think that's too uh much of a word but you know live with it in the short term so that we get the benefits in the five to ten year long term okay so hunter's team suffer through fpo now uh for the benefit that, whoa, later whoa, whoa. <laughs> you said it not me um jake what are your thoughts do you do you agree <laughs> Yeah, I wish I could say something different here, but I got to agree with everything everyone said so far. And I want to point out, you know, if you look at the winners from the last year's Disc Golf Pro Tour, we had eight different unique winners on the Pro Tour last year, uh, seven more if you're including Silver Series, so that's 15 total, right? So when you talk about level of competition, we're seeing people break out, you know, Sayananda, Ali Smith, all these people that, you know, before this or last season were not on the radar, they broke out. And it's possible. I think the solution isn't in the course at all, actually. It's in the field. Brody touched on this. I think we've got to encourage more women into the sport and make them feel comfortable, right? This is a sport that uh, is pretty male-dominated. Walking up to a league or a tournament, you could see, you know, 30, 50 guys and, you know, three or four girls, right? And that can be intimidating for a female player. And I think that's where it lies. You don't beat a course, you beat the field. So what we got to do is make the field greater make the field more populous and we'll see that growth evolve over time. Okay. Okay. So another one for, uh, we need the field to get better. Keep, keep things going the way they are. Um, valid points, Jack round things out for us here. Do you, are you the, uh, are you a believer of this theory as well? Or do you think we need to make these courses easier? Yeah, I'm, I've got nothing much to add that hasn't already been said. I mean, the, the fact is Jake nailed it when he said that you beat the field, you don't beat the course. Um, the course is the object that's used to beat the field. And we're seeing these gaps because the women of uh, the game are pushing themselves to be so much better. And we're just going through a phase right now where your players like Kristen, Evelina, Own, Haley King are just uh, pushing the envelope far more than we've seen before. And pulling the courses back to bring everybody else to them isn't what we need to do. What needs to happen is that the women that are in FPO right now, the women that will be coming into the field in the next 10 to 15 years are going to be striving to be better than the upper echelon right now, not striving just to fit in because fitting in could be losing by 35 strokes. Um, when in reality, no, we're trying to, I'm trying to come in here so I can win and I can be competitive. And in doing so, I need to be able to do what these women are able to do that are at the top of the game. And um, there's a reason that we're we're seeing these gaps. And it really is just we're in this weird range right now of this this uh, this phase where um, some of the women have pushed so far and others are uh, haven't gotten there yet. And we'll get there soon. OK, so similar similar thoughts from everybody kind of it's it's a phase right now. You know, we'll get through it. And, and fair. And to be fair, the men also kind of, you know, their field was not what it is now. Uh, even just go back not too many years and it wasn't what it is now. So that is a fair argument. Brody, do you have something to add? Just an additional thing to add on. I think where FPO right now is they're they're high school. They are right now in the spot of where there's a couple people that are like, I'm I'm the best of the best. But when you get to college, it's a whole different ball game. And I think that's where we're going to see in a couple of years is, you know, Kristen Tatar, we're right, right now looking at her. It's like, holy cow, she's so much better than everyone else. I think five, 10 years from now, it's not going to be that case. And we see it with MPO with some of the players that we talked so highly about, you know, 10 years ago, uh, we're seeing all these younger players now doing things that um, everyone's doing basically at the top. Yeah, fair enough. And, you know, this subject was mostly brought about. There's recency bias to it just because this season we haven't seen any drama yet. Um, but it's certainly 
whenever you have fewer players pushing to the top, like we've seen in FPO, you have less of a chance of that drama. But we did get our fair share last year, and I'm sure we'll get more as things move forward. But no doubt um, what we want, you know, eventually is that stacked leaderboard like we've seen in the MPO division where you've got 10 to 15 guys just separated by, you know, maybe five or six strokes. Um, definitely create some interesting tournaments, but no doubt they can get there. Uh, takes time for sure. So let's move on to our next subject here. So the Open at Austin um, had a, an interesting final round. So the final round at the Open at Austin was reduced to 15 holes, a creative solution to battle the expiring daylight after a lengthy weather delay. Did you approve of this solution? If not, what would you have preferred? Also, does Nicholas have any sort of asterisk on this win, on his win, due to winning as the leader, entering the final round and playing fewer holes? Hunter, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I like the solution. Um, I, I think that the the tough part that they were at was they had a lot of MPO cards already out on the field already, or already out on the course already, and this extended weather delay happened, and they had to figure out a way to not remove parts of the round they had already played, but still cut time for lead card to finish. And I felt like the solution worked out well. Um, I, Cause I, especially I feel like the finishing stretch still had holes that caused plenty of drama, which could have been a really big point of concern with cutting out holes late in the round. Like they did. I didn't feel like it really changed how the, the end of the round finished, which is also a huge point to why I don't think Nicholas has any sort of asterisks on this win because the way that he had to defend it at the end, he got down in the end. He still had to fight with other players. He still played his final round, and he still had to hit a lot of clutch putts down the stretch, um, even though he missed that one on what would have been 16. Um, he had to hit some clutch putts, including the 1-2 win, to hold off a bunch of players that were fighting for that title, which is completely different than players that we have said have an asterisk next to their win when the final round's been cut completely. He still had to get out there, you know, rub some elbows, push some people around, and earn this three because any asterisk next to it. Yeah, well, no doubt that he did have to fight for it. Things uh, things got very interesting towards the end of that round. Um, Jake, what are your thoughts on the solution? Do you agree with Hunter? I do agree with Hunter. Uh, I do like the ending that they chose because I couldn't really think of a better solution for them either. Um, one thing I did want to point out was that this really emphasizes the necessity to play consistent and play well across every round of disc golf, play every hole to your game plan and execute. Because right now, you know, for as much as we talked about the little parity um, or the parity between the FPO players, kind of the opposite with MPO right now. You're seeing a stroke of difference between, you know, 10, 12 players, like you said before. So one stroke can really make all the difference. And Nicholas went out there to win. You could see that he wanted to win. He was locked in. He was focused the entire time. I mean, we haven't seen an ace with a reaction that cold since Chris Dickerson. Um, you can tell that Nicholas just wanted the win. He didn't want anything else. And he said that in his post round interview, he said, um, you know, I came in second, I got close. I'm not going for second again. You know, I, I want this win. And yeah. I think he executed to perfection. So I think it just shows you got to be consistent. You got to be locked in. Um, and that's what he did. And, and people chased him, but unfortunately too little too late. Yeah, no doubt. An exciting win um, for Nicholas and uh, a thrilling finish. Um, Jack, are you on board? Do you like the 15, the 15, uh, whole round or, or do you see kind of a, a problem with it? Yeah, the change to 15 holes was absolutely the right call. Um, especially the way they handled letting all the players know exactly how it would happen. This wasn't like a late rain delay, um, that caused the last five holes to be cut after players had already played them, you know, really changing, not just uh, finishing position when it comes to points, but players that, you know, might be sitting at a 35 foot death putt on the final hole laying up so that they know they're going to make cash. And then all of a sudden those holes get wiped away and it changes. Um, and especially just that everybody know, knew what was going on. I saw Bradley Williams uh, post on his Instagram story, like a screenshot of the text from the pro tour to everyone with the tour card, um, which is just really good. I was uh, keeping score for one of the cards during uh, Waco, uh, the second round at the golf course during the uh, lightning delay. And when they came back, they had no idea if they were going to get to finish that night or if they're going to have to come back. Some of them didn't know, like, if we don't finish, are they just cutting the round short? And then we're starting at the beast the next morning. So making sure that everybody knew was was the uh, was the best way to do that. Um, and there's no need for an asterisk after this win. Nick lost one after three rounds. A round wasn't cut short. He didn't have bad holes that got dropped that jumped him up to first or anything like that. Uh, he went out there and took it when he had to. If anything, he may have had an easier victory 
uh, if the holes, uh, if all the holes were played because of how birdieable and attackable those holes were. Um, but I think the biggest reason there is an asterisk is that Kyle Klein in any of his posts or interviews didn't mention once, oh man, I wish I had those final three holes. I could have caught him or anything like that. Yeah, that, that certainly would have been interesting to see uh, another player bring that up. But they'd have been like, oh, he was done. He was done if we had just a couple more. Uh, Brody, you were there. Uh, so what did you think about everything? Yeah, well, I was kind of there. Um, <laughs> interesting interesting that you chose to say creative solution. I, I think this was unfortunately like the only solution. I don't see another solution they had. Jeff Spring mentioned that he would love to see us be able to finish some of these tournaments out on Monday. That's a whole lot more that they have to go into. Like, I don't know if they're going to be able to rent out. I mean, we had a we had a kid's golf camp that was taking precedent over practice rounds leading into the tournament that kind of just shows you where we are on the hierarchy of uh importance so the fact of them just being like hey by the way monday tomorrow we're gonna actually need it. i don't know what he's talking about there but i would love to see that in the future but they basically have pigeons hold themselves on what they can do there's two tournaments going on at once that is the big problem they have a, an fpo tournament and an mpo tournament if there was just an mpo tournament uh they would be able to have a lot more room to do things but they don't let's talk about pace of play too league card lately has been like two to three holes behind everyone else now i get it cameras crowd all that that's something they need to figure out but why aren't we experimenting with cuts? Why aren't we experimenting with threesomes, with twosomes? Why aren't we doing anything to where we're actually trying to say, hey, we have a problem right now. This is a big issue right now in disc golf. This happened multiple times. Let's try to figure it out. No asterisks on uh, the win. I will say watching, um, watching Gannon and Nicholas and them play that last round like at the speed of light must have just been beautiful for you to witness <laughs> what can what can happen when guys are motivated <laughs> yeah it's like well, what are we doing out here boys? Yeah, jack did you have something to add jack yeah i've got something to add the, the one thing with when it comes to twosomes and threesomes is because of the nature of the sport don't say and we it. don't have no don't, we don't don't have, you dare don't say have, it jack i will sink we, you like the titanic don't you don't say have, it never let go jack <laughs> We don't have, for whatever reason, we don't have like a tournament official per hole with every group that comes to that hole that can be the be all end all when it comes to things. And because of that, if you had a group of twosomes or threesomes, I'm not saying if he, if we could fix that, Brody, then I'm all for twosomes. No one even. The but thing is, is no if, one even listens to those people, though, Jack. That's the problem. There was multiple well, times. I mean, the there was multiple times. Well. Multiple times this tournament where someone threw a shot OB. And we were we were blocked. We could not see what would happen. And there was a spotter up there that is supposed to go and put a flag where the disc crossed, who has a way better idea of where. And I would get up there and someone would be like, no, man, I don't know. No shot. It's here. Look where my disc is. And they're <laughs> so it's like, it's like, bro, I, we're all blocked. I hear you. I, I hear you because if me I've and had you play. Why can't we just I talk played. it out? Me and you. Why do I? Why right. do we need an official now, Brody? You know, I I've had I've had a phantom foot co fault called on me by two guys that that decided that I foot faulted when I didn't <laughs> foot fault. The problem is that's just the nature of the sport, and we don't have a better solution yet. So it's true, man. It would get ugly out there. Yeah, but then you just get your friends on. Uh, people would argue you just get a couple friends on a foursome, and now you get every call going for you because now you have majority. No perfect solution. Why, uh... No perfect solution. Why, why can't, if there were twosomes, just be a situation like that foot fault where, like, if you disagree or whatever, you just call the official over at that point? Well, the officials need well, power. I mean, That's with, a definitely... fault, with a foot fault is you have to see it. Like, well, they yeah. said I did but something. But if you have evidence of, like, I, I mean, I a lot of times you can, then... you can have a clear footprint and be like, look, I don't know. Or at least, like, where discs go out of bounds. Like, a lot of these calls... I think that it, it comes down to just one person versus one person swaying the card anyways. Listen, I don't, I don't yeah. mind having another sport where we get to blame the refs. Is this, yeah, is this real quick? Is this bad? Because a lot of times I don't even insert myself into the situation because if, every, if all three people are like, Oh yeah, right here, this is where you go. My opinion doesn't, doesn't even matter. matter. No, that's valid. Best yeah. not so to. Instead, instead of me fighting and, and now we're backing everyone up. And also, sometimes, guys, we're talking about like two feet on an OB line. Yeah. What, what are we talking about here? No, it's great. I, I, it is my favorite story when I hear about st spotters getting shot down when like oh, they're the only it's one so that saw disrespectful. it. Disrespectful. Yeah, like, like <laughs> no man, you're blind. Trust yes. me. 
It's like that is that is really yeah, funny. Yeah, I know how my disc flies, man. I don't care. If it's <laughs> yeah. all. I no, look where it is. Like, it look hit a the tree. Flight numbers. Look at the flight numbers. There's no <laughs> way the disc can land yeah, there. Yeah, clearly it's a negative one three. So I don't think it would have ended up there. Oh my gosh, that is oh. very funny. I would get I, I would say, get I heated. I don't I don't know how to get this going, but if we can get. I've thought about this for years. I worked the MVP open for three years back in Massachusetts. And if we can just get some kind of training program where you can get a certification for your staff members to be some sort of officials, like they got to go through a did training program. You, did you have to pay their work to MVP open? <laughs> Want to see the cool discs I got for, for paying for it? <laughs> <laughs> valid, valid. Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely a lot going on there. Um, all right, we're going to move on. Uh, <laughs> We're going to move on here. Talk a little bit about Team Disc Mania, who has a red heart, red hot start to the season so far. So, Team Disc Mania has hit the ground running this season. Gannon, Kyle, and Nicholas are dominating the top 10 with two of the three already notching victories. Is it starting to look like they may have the last laugh after losing Eagle to MVP, especially with Simon's early, early season struggles and his break from the tour looming? Um, Jake, what do you got? Last laugh, for sure, no, but the longest laugh, probably, yes. Um, Simon and Eagle were well-established with their fan base. You know, I think a lot of that COVID boom was right around the time Simon, Eagle, Paul, Ricky were really dominating the scene. Um, and so that's why Simon's YouTube channel and, and popularity just grew so fast. Um, so I think he'll be able to move product for a few more years, years him and Eagle, um, even if he's not playing, right? They just have that... Uh, they have that fan base, you know, and his life is disc golf. So even if he's not competing, he's going to be right there making videos somehow involved in the scene. What I think Dismania did was they took the long-term approach. You know, these guys are building their brands and they're going to build it with Dismania. Um, so far they're betting right, right? They're betting on the guys who are winning, but Eagle hasn't been playing at all this season. And, and Simon is somebody who we've seen, you know, really have a bounce back in the later stretch of the tour. Uh, that's when he, really has made his money in the past. So I think that MVP really took a short-term approach or just more of the safe bet, whereas Dismania went with the long-term, right? Uh, Dismania is like the OKC Thunder, whereas MVP is more of the Lakers, right? Get the old guys who know how to win. OKC is just get a bunch of young guys who are, are fun and, and pretty dominant right now. So we'll see how it plays out. I don't think they got the last laugh at all. I think Simon and Eagle have plenty of tricks up their sleeve. I'm excited to see how that plays out. Well, if MVP is the Lakers, they're in trouble because they kind of stink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I like the analogy nonetheless. Um, Jack, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so the thing with this is we need to separate uh, what the company is trying to do when it comes to making money from what the players are doing on the course. Because the fact is we look at disc golf as this team sport when in reality it isn't. What MVP and Discmania is caring the most about is how much money they're making from these players. And they're not going to pay, you know, Discmania, or MVP isn't going to shell out seven figures to Eagle and Simon Lazat if they don't have projections that they're going to make that and then some. MVP isn't going to go and double their warehouse and double their uh, machines and everything if they don't think that they're going to have the uh, – money the cash inflow to make up for that and then some so when it comes to this yeah when you look at how the players have been competing on the pro tour absolutely it looks like Dismania has the last laugh and they probably do because of all of the young talent that they have that has that many more years ahead of them on tour Gannon probably isn't even in his prime yet he's that young same thing with Niklas uh, and Kyle Klein but when it comes to who's getting the last laugh making the money I think it's way too early to tell I think that I mean, every single time that a, a disc comes out that has signed Lizotte's name on it, it gets sold out. I mean, Eagle McMahon, his envies, I haven't been able to find one uh, still in stock anywhere as I was prepping for the show. So, like, when it comes to the manufacturers making their money, I think it's way too early to tell, um, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, too soon to tell. And trusting in the MVP business model process, for sure, um, which, you know, as of late, they have been doing pretty well. Brody, what do you think? Yeah, you know, Jack, uh, I think you made a good point there. If I had the heart of the ocean uh, jewelry piece, I would definitely give it to you. I do not, though. It is still lost at sea somewhere. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this is not a team sport, and I think that's the big thing you have to look at it. 
I think we're getting further and further away from this of where you can have someone that maybe isn't the most popular quarterback, but they join your team that you root for and you have to get behind them. In an individual sport like this, we, the, we as fans get to pick and choose who we want to root for. And if you look at other individual sports, the UFC, golf, F O F one's kind of a team sport, um, tennis, there have been players in the past that have been very good players that just aren't very popular. And so at the end of the day, this is a dis sales uh, situation with these manufacturers. That's what they care about. And we're talking about two of the bi biggest people that move product. We're talking about Eagle and Simon. And um, I think if we see a dominance from Gannon, or if we see a dominance from Nik Niklas or Kyle over a course of 10 years, then maybe we do uh, see a bigger a surgence of fandom and more of their disc sales sale. But right now, Simon and Eagle, uh, they, they don't have to play a single tournament this year and they'll be doing just fine. Okay. All right. So, so far, everybody very, very confident in the brands of Simon and Eagle. Hunter, is there any way to overcome it or is that just the writing on the wall? Well, look, let's just put it this way. And I think Jake was the only one that took a little bit of a different stance. So uh, we're going to have to break down some of the things he said. But what a lot of disc golf fans fail to realize is on course performance and bank account performance are two drastically different things. And businesses care about one a lot more than the other. I'll let you decide which one that is. It's a great start for Discmania. Okay, don't get me wrong, but it's going to take time, them being this dominant, for those players' brands to grow, as Brody was alluding to, for it directly to translate to sales. You know, Jack mentioned Eagles Envy. That thing sold circles around these three players' discs combined year to date. It's just a fact of what it is. Uh, if Discmania is able to keep these players for the next 10 years, sure, you know, Mal, maybe we can talk a little bit. But as MVP's pockets continue to get lined from the Simon Eagle money, who's to say they don't have Gannon, Kyle, and Nicholas? And and he just stands on the back disc mania built the key to the okc <laughs> strategy and the okc analogy right is having the money to keep that young core i have to hear trevor cry about his poor orioles because their good team gets wiped as soon as a big market team comes calling hello knock 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 i'm mvp i've got the money i'm discraft i've got the money where are you headed that's the problem the dominance has to continue for a lot longer it's not time to you know start singing disc mania's praises but it's been a great start it's probably as good of a start as they could ever imagine let's not throw the towel in on mvp yet it's so funny you said that because as soon as you started talking about it i was literally thinking of mvp as the yankees <laughs> that's where my brain went immediately i was like i was like oh you're right man they're just gonna they're just gonna get all this money and then they're gonna buy gannon and it's gonna keep going and going uh jack what did you have to add also just this complete side note, but when MVP is like, hey, we're going to do this really cool disc for our new player, and it's an Envy and a plastic that's never been done before with a cool name and a sick uh, stamp compared to Discmania going, hey, you know the XO Hard Link? Well, we put the GB logo on it three times in the middle of it and called it a special disc. I mean, there's obvious differences <laughs> between these two discs and how well they're going to sell. So Listen, just putting that out there. Jack, it sounds like you want this envy really bad. <laughs> yeah. Can someone hook up my boy, Jack? I, no, listen, I have one. No, I have one. I already have one. You have one. one. Okay. okay. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. I have one on my desk. Maybe if you win, there can be an arrangement made or something. <laughs> Put a little pressure on it. I was thinking about Close. tossing it, but oh my question goodness question i had going back to like the connection between performance and how well a brand does why how did mvp get a lot of its money in the first place or a lot of its popularity particularly with the envy right like what happened on a course a few years ago that really pushed mvp to the top hey, and their sales the envy. that was on course that's true the, the moment the moment was big the moment oh, was big I, I will also no. say too james conrad is a big fan favorite as well he is. yeah 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 yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it is a, like, like a lot of you mentioned, it is a time thing, right? Because people like a lot of people like Gannon and Kyle and, and Nicholas, like yes. they are, they are guys that people can root for. I would say the most polarizing personality is Gannon. Um, but people still like him. And there are a lot of people who like those other two as well. So yes, over time, we may see this turn into a situation. And if they're able to retain them because their contracts aren't forever, um, this isn't like everybody's on the Simon deal. Does Dismania have a pace of play issue? That could be a narrative. People are talking about it. Back to about back, it. back to back tournaments where there are the, people, uh, excessive, excessive time. It's, there are people talking about it. We're talking about it right now. Um, Maybe I need to just try to get an excessive time violation next tournament and then I'll win. 
You should have just named your podcast excessive time violation. Yeah, that's, that's a true. good one. That's I actually can't. snore someone, life. Right? Someone is hundred percent gonna steal that now. Or pace of play or something like something along pace those of lines. Play. Yeah, I like it. That's My a good goodness. That's a good one too. I, I <laughs> oh, intellectual so property that so that you could do that. Yeah. Those are gonna cost you five hundred dollars each. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. I've already got merch, it's already rolling. Um, all right, we got one more topic here, kind of a fun one before we get into our final topic. Um, we're gonna talk about the cowboy hat. Have to talk about the cowboy hat. Um, so the Stetson hat, I'll call it by its name. The Stetson hat, uh, otherwise known as the cowboy hat, given to the winner at the Open at Austin, has its share of fans and haters. I myself didn't love it last season, but I found myself more fond of it this season, mostly because it felt more like a tradition. I think wearable trophies might just take a few goes to sink in, unlike your standard trophy. Do you agree? Do other tournaments from disc golf or otherwise have trophies that are now iconic, but would seem silly if it weren't for the nostalgia and tradition? Um, all right. This could be controversial. Jack, what do you think? Yeah, I think the hat is a cool and unique trophy. I think we need to give more tournaments and tournament staff the time to come up with cool stuff and create traditions. Uh, we can't complain that there is no tradition with an event when it shows up twice and then gets kicked off the tour altogether. Um, and then complain like, oh, that's so random. No one's ever done that before. Well, we've only ever seen it once or twice. Um, so when it comes to having tradition from a trophy, of course, anything, we need to give them patience. I know that wearable trophies are a little weird, but I'm just putting this out there. Imagine if the first time the Masters used a green jacket, people are all like, oh, that's so weird, and then it just went away. I mean, now it's the most iconic trophy in sports and the most coveted trophy in sports. Um, so I think we just need to recognize how young our sport is and how long it takes for things to become traditions. I think that the MVP Open winner holding up a wooden sign that never leaves the property would be weird if it wasn't the standard and a thing that then everyone knows their name gets added to that. Um, so I think with a lot of tournament directors have good intentions with trophies and are just trying to figure stuff out. Um, who knows the steering wheel from the AFDO might have become cool if we saw it more often, or it may have been replaced this year with something else. Uh, the tournament staff realizing, hey, we should do something different. But when a tournament gets cut from the tour altogether, then we never know. And we'll just always look at that and laugh look back when we look back to it and, and not know if they learned their lesson, tried something new, or if it uh, gained popularity. Hey, I like it. Good points. I, I do agree. Like, Hey, if a tournament popped up right now and masters didn't exist and their tournament, their trophy was a bright green jacket. Who knows what we'd be saying about it right now? Who knows? Um, Brody. Yeah, I had, yeah, well, I agree with the green jacket. I think that was the one that popped out for most of us when it comes to something, you know, it's also timely. It's almost masters week, which is awesome. Um, the one thing I do want to say though, is like, if I went and asked a lot of master winners, hey, man, like, where's your green jacket? They probably would know where it was. Gannon has no idea where his hat was last year. So that, that is something that might be over time. It might, you know, end up becoming something that's a little bit more important to players. But right now, you hear this a lot. I think Bradley Williams left one of his trophies in the Airbnb. It's happening a lot where players are like open, openly talking about how they do not care about these trophies. And that obviously I think does hurt. The one thing I do want to add though, to what Jack's point is you don't just get to win a green jacket. You also get to win a gold medal and you also get a sterling replica of the uh, permanent master's trophy as well. So there's a lot more that goes into it than just, and I would love to see that too is like the cowboy hat. I think it's a cool presentation, Nicholas, I honestly looks like a good cowboy. He looked good in the hat. He looked good in the hat. Um, but I wish there was something a little bit more that you can maybe put on your uh, mantle or something when you go home. Um, so we'll see. But I think I think the tradition thing is one of those things where over time, a lot of these things make a lot more sense the more we see them. Yeah, I I, I agree. I like the uh, additional pr- trophy when you do have the wearable one to just kind of have that secondary thing. And uh, I do feel like they upgraded the hat this year. I feel like it was nicer. It did look a little bit nicer. Um, what happened yeah. to the belt buckle? Well, they kind of Thank like, you. they kind of like s- sewed on. Wait, the belt buckle wasn't on the hat last year? No, they had both, I think. I think it was like a, I think it was dual. I think they got belt buckle. No, that's and Texas States. I thought Texas States was the belt buckle. I'm almost positive Open at Austin had a belt buckle. I thought Ricky was holding up a belt buckle after he won Texas States. I could have swore there was a I belt buckle. I remember that too, Trev. Yeah, uh, fact check that, bro. Hunter, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll look it up right now. Hunter, go ahead. 
Well, first off, I'm going to say uh, Nicholas is what we call around these parts, all hat, no cattle, I think. Uh, fine looking cowboy, but I think it might be all show. Uh, no, <laughs> so tradition covers a multitude of sins. Let's just call it what it is, okay? You do anything long enough in sports and it becomes beloved and ingrained. I mean, heck, go to LeBron throwing the powder up in the air. Probably was a lot less cool the first time people got showered with baby <laughs> what it is now. Um, and I, people get caught up in the green jacket, but I think I just want to harp on a point that was kind of brushed over, which is the green suit jacket of the Masters is not just the trophy. There is an actual physical trophy. If you go Google the trophy presentation, they're wearing the green jacket and holding that replica of the clubhouse, Did you not which is very I, important. Okay. I said I wanted, to, I wanted to drive it home a bit more. It was mentioned, but I wanted to drive it home because the hat would be received completely different if a player wore it and hoisted this sick crystal metal trophy. Like That would look completely different. Um, but give it 10 more years and then that exact hat and all of a sudden it's probably going to be beloved. Heck, give it long enough and I might fall in love with a blank chessboard. Who knows? And maybe 50 years down the road or something. The the hat was at least branded with the tournament logo, which definitely helps. But yeah, I think over time, the more this is presented, the less, you know, gimmicky it feels. Because I mean, one year we, we put a silver jacket on Paul for being the Pro Tour Championship winner and it looked hilarious. Give that 10 more years, it might have been fine. I don't know. It was pretty reflective. That that was. Did we get it? Did we get a fact check yeah. on the? Uh, I think it might have been Texas State. I'm not seeing any I, belt buckles with Gannon here. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure that Sport that Ricky had it for Texas State's. No, you can you can double fact check if you want, Hunter. But I'm a triple fact check. I'm a I'm a double fact. I'm a triple fact check. Is double. No, fact check. Ricky. Ricky's literally holding a belt buckle Thank to you. the thing. I'm a scholar. I'm a scholar of this game. Can we say um, though that there are some trophies that no matter how long you do yes. it, it is not good. Totally. To be good totally okay totally like a, like a chess board all right jake or, or, or go like off. A, oh yeah oh, sorry. go off jake <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah no um i guess we'll, we'll move to my turn then i look wearable trophies i think is an interesting point like i think the the cowboy hat is a good start for just texas but i can't see any other wearable trophies really working out i think the focus should be more on you know, objects that maybe represent the city. That guitar in Simon's hand was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. That picture of Greg Barsby with the axe, again, one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And I want people to the Google heck disc have you golf. been watching? <laughs> what do you mean? The PCS Sula Trophy. It's like someone going to a Texas Roadhouse and going, this is the best steak I've ever had in my life. It is. And I'll stand by that. Yeah, that's facts. <laughs> But anyway, no, I look wearable trophies. I think the, the trophies need to reflect the tournaments for the smaller tournaments. I think when it comes to the larger tournaments, we just need to have pretty straightforward standard trophies and really get the tradition out of the, the majors, right? Out of the, the major tournaments themselves. Um, you know, I would rather say I'm a U.S. champion than have a really cool trophy. Um, that says I'm a U.S. champion. Or I would rather just have the history behind it. And I think that's what most of the players are going for um, is the history and, and getting their name in the books more so than the trophies for those ones. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Here's the thing about the wearable trophies. So the reason I wrote this question is because I didn't last year. I remember just kind of being like, okay, the cowboy hat is funny. I, so much so that I literally made Hunter and I t-shirts with Gannon Burr wearing the cowboy hat. Cause I thought it was so funny, but this year, whenever I saw it, a, it looked nicer. That was a key. And then B, whenever Nicholas put it on, I kind of like, I kind of felt the moment a little bit because it was a big moment he won. Like he was proud to throw the hat on and it looked awesome. Like Nicholas wearing a cowboy hat was an all time image. And I thought to myself like, wow, that sunk in kind of quick. And here's the thing. Everybody wants to do the wearable trophy because of what the masters did, but it, it, you have to get it right. And you can't do too many. If, if every single tournament in all of disc golf did a wearable trophy, we'd get sick of them. So if you're a tournament that has the guts to pick something out and stick to it, then you can establish yourself as one of the wearable trophy tournaments. And then everybody else who does it is copying you. So maybe open Austin, if they can get ahead of this thing and just keep, keep nailing in the, the cowboy hat thing, you know, 10 years from now, we can be talking about the cowboy hat in a whole different looking, light. <laughs> looking at the cowboy hat from last year, just trying to find the belt buckle, which is not there. Belt buckle doesn't yeah, exist. No belt uh, buckle. <laughs> noticeably nicer this year. Yeah. I think that played yeah. a lot in it. It does. The, it, the cowboy hat this year was a lot nicer. When I saw it last year, I thought, that's a prop. This year when I saw it, I thought, wow, that's a very nice hat. Like that's that's my first I was like, oh, that's a that's a nice hat. Like you saw like it had like the Stetson logo on it. They branded it, like tastefully branded the hat. Um before I go, I got two points. Okay. 
One, you're not going to we... get two points, but you can no, no, say no, two points. Fine. One, should we do something where like every win you get, you get an item, and if you get enough wins, then your items attach to actually form <laughs> a the <weapon>. trophy. <laughs> and then the second one is who should we be rooting for next year to win? That would look the most ridiculous in a cowboy hat. Emerson Keith. No, I think Emerson would pull it off. Because he's small. Nah, Sorry, Emerson. He's a Texan. Good I know he's a Texan, but like I, it's such a big it hat. Like that's Nicholas. James half Conrad. the reason half James the reason it, No, he would look sick. Half the reason that Nicholas no, looked like a little silly in the hat was because he's like a small guy. Nicholas is very short. It's a huge hat. Like it would probably make me look tiny. I don't know. I got to think on that. I'll have an answer at the end of the show. Yeah, that's yeah. Bring your answer at the end of the it show. That's also, a, bring, Nick, bring who you think would look best in the hat. My yeah, I want to know who Chris would look Clinton. best as well. And you best can't just say Ezra. And, best and worst. Ezra eight year old. Yeah. Ezra is Nick Loss's is Nick uh, uh PD this year going to say Nordic Cowboy instead of Nordic Phenom? Dude, like, is that, you better claim is that Nick, you better claim going? property on that. That's a really good idea. Take a page yeah, out of my book. Ask me how much I've collected off my intellectual property. Zero dollars. But I've got a I feel lot like stored up. With the URLs I own. Yeah. Um, all right. We're gonna we're gonna move on to our final topic now. Um, enough fun time. Let's get down to business. Hunter, Jack. Let's move on to the finals. On to our last topic. Hunter, you have a one point lead, sixteen to fifteen. Would you like to go first or second? I'll take first. Okay. Oh, he wants the ball. He wants the ball. New overtime. Um, all right. Two minutes, 10 points up for grabs. Here's our topic. Do you feel that the new layout at the Open at Austin was a good representation of how to transform a golf course into a disc golf course? Do you think that the changes made to the layout from last year were warranted and bettered the course overall? And do you think there are other properties on tour that could improve with a layout change? Go for it. Yeah, I want to really focus here on the golf course hybrid aspect, right? Um, I think the layout here was great. I think the changes from last year to this year were very well received, and I think it went well, but let's be honest here, okay? Let's just look at this objectively. One of the reasons that this course and Lake Waco uh, didn't feel that much like we're playing on a golf course is because they're just not that nice of golf courses. The ground just wasn't maintained to the level that a really, really nice golf course typically is. Like sometimes when we saw at uh, the one wild horse and we've seen at OTB Open, which makes you kind of get immersed a lot easier into this is just a disc golf course out there. The other thing that I think is big that this is the designer's idea um, is they didn't just play alongside the golf course. They actually like went into the woods a little bit on this one and they basically just took this is what the property offers. How can I make the best disc golf course possible? which is a lot better than if we're just playing up the fairways and next to the greens and stuff like that. It's just going to feel like we're on a golf course, which has been the problem that we've made history with in the past. So I think that's something that some of these other golf course hybrid courses should be looking at of like, when I have this property, forget about the flow the golf course has right now. What's the best disc golf course I can possibly put on um, out here? And adding some wooded holes, I think for this one in particular, helped with the flow and broke up the course. And if other properties can do that, if, if courses will let them kind of cut into the woods at all, um, I think that's a great option as well. Uh, this is a different yeah. idea I had that could very easily already be implemented. I've just never paid attention, but I had the idea of planning and I was like, if this hasn't been implemented, it really should be, which is making sure we remove the golf flags from greens when we're playing, mm -hmm. because that's something that just kind of is a dead giveaway on coverage. When Even if you're like way on a different part of the fairway and you see a golf green with a flag, it's just a reminder like, hey, we're on someone else's property. So making sure we pull those out before we play is a super easy fix also to help immerse you in the fact that uh, we're on a golf course. That's a good point. I don't know if... Brody, do they typically remove the flags? Oh, you're adding me in. Okay, yes, because I was going to say, yeah, in order to do that, Hunter, you actually have to rent out the entire golf course, which we were not able to do at Lake Waco. There actually was a four-man scramble tournament going on. Um, so, yeah. I will say, talking about uh, the immersion into the away from the golf course, one of my favorite B-roll shots of all time uh, was it either <laughs> last week or the week before where they put a golf ball cleaner behind the leaderboard. And I thought about, <laughs> that was an all-time move. Like, some guy was sitting there with his camera on that, like, this is the one, guys. Like, pick me. <laughs> I've got, I've got a shot. The same as the, uh, the fresh azaleas in, uh, at, that, uh, yeah. at Augusta. Like, it's same crusty golf shot. ball cleaner. It's like, it has nothing to do with the sport we're playing, nor is it fun to look at. It's a golf <laughs> Maybe he didn't know what it was. He was like, look at this thing. It's got a fun handle on it. Yeah, gumball out of this? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Where did um, I put my quarter? Yeah. All right, Jack, what are your thoughts? Yeah, my biggest frustration when it comes to watching tournaments that take place on golf courses is when we have sand traps and greens that um, are just right in the middle of the hole, but it's like, oh, no, this is OB, right? Like, that is, to me, that is so stupid and so frustrating. It's like, this is the most pristine part of the course, and I get that. And I understand that golf courses really want to take care of their property and keep that um, in, in its best looking shape as possible. But then when you're having shots that it's like, you know, 500 feet down the fairway that, you know, come into play, it's, it gets annoying and frustrating and it's make it so clear that it's a golf course. I would push back on, uh, the golf course this weekend being a, a crappy looking golf course is the reason that it didn't feel like a golf course. I think it didn't feel like a golf course because the holes were created in such a way that it didn't feel just like a wide open hyzer fest. I mean, the players were asked to really, really, um, use some interesting shot shapes. I think a lot about those par fours through the woods that they cut out that were really, really challenging because they were asking very, very uh, precise shot shapes of specific flip ups. Or, um, you know, they kept talking about probably too much about Niklas and his turnovers with the overstable approach disc. Um, but like having to ask for specific shots like that that aren't typically found in in the in most wooded golf. Um, I just found that really, really cool and fascinating. The reason that it, it felt like it wasn't really on a golf course. And when it comes to change, uh, layout changes throughout other courses on tour, um, I think there's a lot of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, I think that uh, Waco this last weekend or two weekends ago now, the new hole, I thought it was dumb. Um, I understand that that was a good place to put the vendor village, but like if that hole wasn't a bad hole. So why are we changing it? Um, I think there are a lot of courses that could use some changes, but I think we're too antsy to change things. Mm, okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think um, one of the big, the big factors there is just what shots you're asking of the players. Is it just going to be wide open hyzers or are they going to actually have to throw disc golf lines? Because when people, people associate disc golf courses with hyzer flips to turns down tunnels or um, shots that make the disc move left to right or right to left, like side to side, I guess is the best way to put it, rather than just pushing shots out there and uh, and letting them fall. Um, good points, and, and I agree with both of you. Mostly, um, I do kind of think that Hunter is right in the sense, I don't, I don't know that course was in the best shape, but I don't know how much, I'd, I'd like to see them take a design like this that I feel like was really good and put it on a really, a course that's in really good shape and see if I would like notice the difference a ton. Because I do feel like this course played like very much aside from the actual golf course. But if it were in really good shape, I wonder if it would have stuck out more. It's, it's tough to notice. Um, all right. Well, Hunter, you are victorious today. One point managed to hang on um, in your in your return to the show. Any final thoughts? No. Oh, can I can I take your time then to to add? Yeah, add these points? get your time. Bernie yeah. gets his time. Okay, one final rebuttal. Hole 15 at Waco. Let's be honest; it's one of the worst looking holes in the world, Jack. I don't know. This is the same thing as Jake was saying. Where it's like this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. I don't know what you guys have been looking at. There's an electrical box in the middle of it. I didn't there's, say it was there's the a best bunch looking of, thing I've seen in my you life. You said it was a great hole. Don't break it if you don't fix it. Also, it was like a liability. It would almost kill someone in the back of 18. Like they would eight, people on 18 would be looking at the 18 hole played almost, pretty well though even though it looked yes, bad yes that's what i'm saying that's yes. what i'm saying as a whole in the tournament it played great all of the other factors fine there's nothing like you know well that's why they to took it out to though that. that's why they took it out the other factors um okay best <laughs> looking oh, this in is the hat best looking i'm gonna be honest with you guys we have a lot of people in disc golf i don't know if this is a theme a lot of people that look good in a hat Going to say it right now. A lot of guys. I think you would look good in that hat. I got to be honest with you. I'd be decent. I mean, Chris Clemens. Tristan he, Tanner. Chris, Tristan. Chris Clemens would look like a movie star in that hat. Yeah. But I think I'm, I'm just looking right now. Someone on a rocking chair uh, with some lemonade in their hand on their front porch. He's got a piece of hay coming out where he's just plucking his teeth. Yeah. Mason Ford. I think Mason Ooh, Ford. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think he looks like he could herd some cattle. He does. I think he absolutely takes the cake. And I think worst, I think this, I think this is even better. <laughs> I think this one's easy. 
I think it's Drew Gibson. I think Drew Gibson would look the absolute <laughs> worst. With all the look tattoos. The absolute worst cowboy looking Drew Gibson. I I mean, yeah, it definitely does not fit his style. Um, I feel like that's like he would wear that with his I think like, that's a, that should be a challenge. Drew, if you're listening to this, post yeah. on Instagram. <laughs> I want to see the, the cowboy trap of you and a cowboy. I want to get out. Under, underrated in a cowboy hat i think would be marweed i think he'd be that great mild mannered very just <laughs> yeah. uh, he was, he's just there he was, to do his business right? he was up he's there not, yeah yeah he was up there for sure i think i want to hear point, in the comments point. below um oh i went i went dark i want to hear in the comments below what everybody's uh pick yeah, for cowboy favorite hat cowboy favorite cow maybe someone out there is really good at photoshop can photoshop a cowboy I, hat um i'm back Look, um, i think i think a lot of people would have looked good in the hat i don't think a lot of people would have looked as good as greg with the axe i mean i think that, the hair pretty fitting yeah that might have to be it the other the thing yell. you can comment the yell. comment who looks yeah. best in the hat oh, yeah. who would look best with the axe the battle axe um before we wrap up the show though Throw the QR code up on the screen here. If you are looking to submit any topics to debate, um, you can scan this code here on the screen or click the link in the description, give you access to submit them. Um, thanks, Brody. Um, we're always looking for topics and do these in real time. You know, you can give us topics that don't have anything to do with recent events, just, you know, overarching broad disc golf debate topics or if the events just, you know, I usually put these scripts together on Mondays. So if the event has just ended or it's in the middle of the event and you think of a topic, just go ahead and submit it right then and there because we like to do things for current events as well. Um, so, yeah, make sure to check that out. Scan the QR code. Click the link in the description. Nobody cares about your sports cards. I'm not saying it. I'm just I'm throwing something in the background. Yeah, dude, he's not saying anything, Trevor. Come yeah, on. you're right. You're right. That's that's on me, guys. Um, I think my getting... fault you have a terrible football team. I'm not going to get into that. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next week.